Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The first step in the fabrication of a porcelain metal restoration is the making of the wax pattern. The removable dye is lubricated and excess lubrication is carefully blotted from the dye. A very thin layer of soft green wax is applied to the dye. This gives a very accurate adaptation to the metal dye. Then small increments of blue wax are used to build up the wax pattern. The labial surface will only be four tenths of a millimeter thick. Additional wax is applied to the mesial and distal to give rigidity to the pattern. The pattern is placed in the articulator and the occlusion is checked and further refinements to the porcelain metal junction are made. The finished pattern is taken off the die and examined. And if it is correct, it is replaced on the die and a wax sprue is attached to the incised ledge. It's important that there's enough wax on the incised ledge of the pattern to be able to hold this wax sprue. The sprue is attached to a sprue former so that the pattern is a quarter inch from the top of the investment. Conical shape is made also in the sprue former to aid in gold flow. Two wax patterns or a bridge can be sprued on a horizontal bar. This allows better flow of the metal. A phosphate bonded investment is mixed and applied to the wax pattern. The wax pattern has been painted with a surface tension reducing agent and the investment is very carefully flowed on the external surface and internal surface of this wax pattern. The phosphate bonded investments is a special investment for ceramic metals and is able to take the high temperatures. A asbestos liner is placed in a casting ring. This has been wetted and this will be placed on the sprue former. The remainder of the investment then is carefully flowed into this casting ring. This investment will set up and be very hard and very dense. You'll note that the investment is slightly overfilled. The investment sets up with a very hard glazed surface that has to be removed with a lab knife so that the air and gases in the ring will be able to diffuse out the end of the ring when the pattern is cast. The sprue former is removed and any bits of investment and asbestos are carefully cleaned away so that they will not become inclusions in the gold casting. The investment then is placed in a oven and brought up to 1300 degrees and is heated in the oven for an hour and a half. Ceramic metal is heated in a crucible without an asbestos liner. The asbestos contains arsenic and can contaminate the ceramic metal. Here we're using an oxygen natural gas flame. This gives us a flame that's hot enough to melt the metal. Glasses are also used to keep the uh, glare and the brightness of this metal from harming our eyes. When the metal has reached a bouncy, lively condition, it's very bright, then the investment is removed from the oven and placed in the casting machine. We use an additional amount of gold 
and there is an additional wind to the casting machine to give extra casting pressure. The metal is further heated until it has reached its proper casting temperature, and then the casting machine is released. The investment is very difficult to remove from the casting ring. It is released from the ends and then it is pushed out of the casting ring and then the remaining investment is cut away from the casting. The casting is scrubbed and cleaned and is cleaned in an ultrasonic cleaner and then is pickled in hydrofluoric acid overnight. The clean casting is examined for bubbles and investment inclusions and is tried on the die. If the casting fits correctly and the margins are accurate, then the sprue button and sprue are removed. In this case, we are using a carborundum disc. This disc will be used to cut through the tough ceramic metal. You will find that the ceramic metal is much harder. It has a higher Brunel hardness and it is more difficult to finish and to cut through and to polish. A ceramic bound stone or wheel is used to dress down the casting. Four tenths of a millimeter is the thickness that is correct for the labial surface. A gauge can be used to measure this four tenths of a millimeter. If the casting is thinner than this, the gold can sag when the portion is fused. The casting again is tried on the die and examined. The casting is then tried back on the articulator to check the occlusion and the contours and inner proximal areas. And if this is correct, then we are ready to apply the porcelain. The casting needs to be degassed as the first step in the fusing procedure. The purpose of degassing is to burn out any inclusions of investment and abrasive and also to oxidize the surface. The degassing procedure is done by heating the casting to 1925 degrees in an air-fired oven. There are tin and iron oxides in the metal and these oxides will help form the adhesion of the porcelain to the metal. The dials are set to 1925 and then when the temperature has reached this point the casting will be removed and cooled. The oxidized casting will have a dull surface and this is removed from the oven and placed on an asbestos slab and then covered with a small cup. The first stage in applying the porcelain is to mix the opaque porcelain. The purpose of the opaque porcelain is to mask the gold color and to adhere to the gold casting. The proper shade is chosen and is placed on a tile. A stay wet solution is also placed on the slab. A creamy mix of porcelain is made to apply to the metal crown. The casting is rather difficult to handle, so a hemostat will be used to grasp the casting. This is applied to the lingual surface. 
and makes a convenient handle in holding the casting while the opaque is being applied. The opaque is called paint opaque and we will be painted on the labial surface. This is very carefully applied so that porcelain will not go on the internal surface of the casting. It is important that the entire labial surface is covered and that the metal does not show through. Also, just the areas where the porcelain is to be applied are covered. Vibration helps in the condensation of the porcelain. Also, a gauze or a tissue can be used to blot out additional moisture. This helps condense the porcelain and make it more dense. The casting is placed on a little spike, and then this is placed again in the ceramic oven. The porcelain is dried on the apron of the oven. This allows a gentle heating of the porcelain. porcelain then is placed into the oven and uh, the oven door is closed and this will be heated to 1700 degrees under a vacuum. Vacuum fired porcelain is a denser tougher piece of porcelain so that the first 1700 degrees of fusion is done under a vacuum of 25 to 29 inches of mercury. When the vacuum has reached this level the pump is turned off, and this vacuum is held during the initial baking. At this time, the rheostat is changed, and the temperature is raised to 1700 degrees. When the oven has reached 1700 degrees, the vacuum is released, and any additional heating now will be done under air firing. In this case, we'll be raising the temperature to 1825 degrees. So 125 degrees will be done under air firing. This is an automatic oven, so we will simply set the dials to 1825. At 1825, the oven is opened, and the hot porcelain will be removed and placed on an asbestos block and covered with a, a metal tin so that air currents will not cool the porcelain and crack it. It's important to cover this so that there are no distortions in this porcelain. The baked opaque porcelain has a stippled glassy appearance as you see here. Gingival body to porcelain is mixed and applied in this case with a spatula. It can be applied with a brush or with a spatula. In this case, we're using a spatula to add the porcelain and carefully blot the porcelain. The purpose of blotting is to condense the porcelain to make it more dense. Here we roughly form the contours of this crown. The dye is placed back into the articulator and incisal colored porcelain is added. The contacts are made with the adjacent teeth, remembering that there's going to be a 20% shrinkage when we bake this porcelain. The porcelain is further blotted and contoured. It can be carved and shaped to the approximate shape that we would like in the final restoration.
is trimmed away from the interproximal area so the dye can be removed. More incisal porcelain is added on the lingual surface, and you'll note how the moisture can be reduced by blotting. Additional porcelain is added on the lingual surface, and this can be brushed also to give it a smoother surface and to blend the porcelain into the existing porcelain. After blotting, we can take a sharp instrument and open up the embrasure areas to make sure again that we have the contours and we can remove the dye. We are trying to match the cuspid on the other side. And since this is a peg lateral, we have some additions to make and some changes to make of this incisal edge to make it look the same as the cuspid on the other side. Here we're using a brush to contour the porcelain and to smooth and brush the excess away. The incisal, again, is further modified to match the cuspid on the other side of the arch. And is further blotted to re remove the moisture. Brushing also helps condense the porcelain. Distilled water is used to clean the porcelain off the casting and the internal surface of the casting. The porcelain is placed on the apron of the oven and is allowed to dry and to heat. And you will note soon the porcelain will become brownish. This is the starch that is used to hold the porcelain together, burning out. The purpose of the starch is to hold the porcelain together so it will not fall apart when we're condensing. When this has been heated sufficiently, it'll be placed in the oven and then heated to 1,700 degrees under vacuum and then an additional 100 degrees air fired. The fused porcelain is examined and then is placed on the articulator. You'll notice that the mesial contact is open because of the shrinkage of the porcelain. The distal also is slightly open, and there is a slight concavity on the labial surface. Additions now will be made to that porcelain. The lingual surface also needs to be adjusted. It is rather thick, so a porcelain grinding wheel be, will be used to contour that surface of the restoration. Modifications of anatomy also can be made at this time. Porcelain then is added on the mesial and distal contact to build this out. It is blotted in the same manner as we did before in fabricating the original porcelain. Additions can be made seven or eight times in this manner, so it is very easy to fabricate this type of restoration. The embrasure areas are opened up again so that the dye and the restoration can be removed easily. And a brush is used to blend the additions of porcelain to the existing porcelain. The contact areas are blended into the rest of the restoration by using a wet brush. Any other blending is done at this time with this fine hair brush. The restoration is placed in an oven and the temperature is brought up to 1700 degrees under vacuum. Then the vacuum is released and the temperature brought up to 1800 degrees to obtain a natural glaze on the porcelain metal restoration.
The restoration is placed on the model and compared with the cuspid. The peg lateral restoration needs to have further modifications to the incised ledge. If slight modifications are made, they can be polished. If several modifications are made, the restoration may be reglazed in the oven. When we're happy with the porcelain, then the gold will be polished. We will be using a rubber wheel. This can be either a Kratex or a Dedeco rubber wheel. Also BBC on a felt wheel. And then lastly, we'll be using rouge on a felt wheel. This will give a final polish to the metal. It's important to have a high polish so that the plaque will not be retained in this marginal area. Here we see the final restoration, which is high glaze and its incisal contouring it gives it, that gives it a natural appearance. Here we see the restoration in the patient's mouth. You'll note that the restoration blends in harmoniously with the rest of the teeth. Here we have taken a peg ladder with spaces, both on the mesial and distal, and converted it into a cuspid, matching the contours and incisal edge of the cuspid on the other side of the arch, making a pleasing, harmonious restoration. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.